I am Dr. Michael Klein, the CTO and Medical Director of Keystone Dental and Paltop Advanced Dental Solutions. And I'd like to welcome you today to today's webinar titled Creating Predictable Outcomes, New Tools and Techniques. Now, uh, before we get started, I'd like to also encourage you to visit our educational platform, Paltop Academy. We have many lectures. Uh, tonight's lecture will be recorded and placed in the on-demand section. So for those of you that would like to view it again or recommend it to any of your friends and colleagues, you're welcome to see it's a free educational platform and they can, uh, they can see it in the on-demand section. We have many, many other informative and interesting lectures from a panel of internationally known speakers in several different languages, both English, Spanish, French, and German on the website as well. So I encourage you to visit uh, and see all the information that we have on the Paltop Academy website. Now, tonight's uh, topic, Creating Predictable Outcomes, new, to new Tools and Techniques, is part two. Part one of Creating Predictable Outcomes dealt with, uh, with the significance of an ultra-pure surface on an implant, such as Paltop, as well as concepts of uh, the significance of the transgingival design of the abutment and how it has an effect and impact on long-term bone maintenance, as well as the aesthetic result of the uh, soft tissue profile that you want to develop for your, for your uh, patients and restorations. Now, having said that, if you haven't seen part one, part two stands alone. It has nothing to do with part one, so you don't need to stop and go see that first. Enjoy tonight today's uh, presentation. But when you have an opportunity, I think you'll find it interesting and intriguing, and uh, I introduced some new concepts there. So please go visit. You can see it in the on-demand section on Paltop Academy. Now, the first... Uh, uh, new tool or technique that we're going to talk about deals with fully guided surgery. And I have some history with this. I wrote one of the original patents in fully guided surgery. You can see here that uh, oh, it was back in 1997 already. And I built a company called Implant Logic Systems and we produced software called VIP, Virtual Implant Placement Software, to surgical or virtual placement of implants. And we fabricated custom uh, fully guided surgical guides, um, as well as providing services in the area of fully guided surgery. I sold the company to BioHorizons back in 2008. So I have somewhat of a history and understanding of fully guided surgery. I also understand that there are some limitations to it. Um, uh, one of them being that uh, you, know, you have the potential for blocking irrigation as you're drilling through the guide. Um, I have some knowledge for this. You can see I wrote a paper back oh, already in 1996 with Miles Yacker that I published in the International Journal of Oil Microspatial Implants that dealt with heat generation uh, while drilling in while drilling in bone. So this is just one of the issues that we'll talk about now relative to fully guided surgery. So in an attempt at this point, already now, it's 2020, but this already we came up a couple of years ago, I developed along with the engineers at Paltop Advanced Dental Solutions, a new concept in digital guidance. What I call it is contra-angle based guidance. So what, is, what does that mean or why is there even a need for it? So one of the effects had to do again with providing irrigation as we are drilling in bone. So as opposed to having the irrigation block as we drill through a sleeve, as we see in most systems, we have a window that's inside uh, this device over here that allows there to be irrigation on the drill as we're drilling through the bone that's not being blocked or obscured by the drill guide sleeve. So one benefit of this uh, new concept of triangle based guidance. Second, we have uh, limitations in the ability of how wide can a patient open their mouths. The drills that we use in fully guided surgery are very long, 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters, 30 millimeters. Well, what if a patient is having an implant placed in the posterior mandible maxilla 
or a first molar or a second molar. Sometimes it's even difficult in a second premolar site. So do we have a, an avenue or, or a way to manage these, uh, these very, very long drills? And so again, with contra-angle-based guidance, we can come in at an angle, okay? And only when the drill comes to the level of bone do we have to upright it, and we still gain full guidance. Another benefit of contra-angle-based guidance. And how about metal shavings that we sometimes find in the wound? When we have the drill and the drill drills through the sleeves, as this drill moves up and down the sleeves, the cutting blades cut the metal. And, and occasionally, you know, most of you that have done guided surgery will probably find um, that you have some little shards, a tiny, tiny little pieces of titanium from the sleeves that are inside the wound, and we try and suction it up, clean it out the best we can. But with this constant contra-angle-based guidance, we have no cutting uh, drill flutes that spin against the metal sleeve. So we never have any metal shavings in, in the wound. This clearly can be seen here. So what moves up and down is the digital guidance sleeve, right? And the drill spins freely of the of the sleeve that's inside the surgical guide. So three significant benefits that we can gain from digital based guidance or contra angle based guidance. So how does it work? Well, we have a device called a DGS, a digital guidance sleeve. And here's how it appears. And it, it fits inside, let me see if I can get a pointer here. It fits inside, uh, if it's inside the head of a special contra angle. So there's a contra angle, okay, that comes as part of the kit that has these two holes in there. And the there are two rods, it's part of the digital guidance sleeve, and they fit into the contra angle. So it all fits together as one unit. And then the drills fit in and out of this and are changed as we require different lengths or different diameters of drills. Now, as we go through our drilling procedure, right, we have drills, and we again, they change in, in diameter, and they can also change in length. And they go in, in and out of the digital guidance sleeve until the osteotomy is completed. So here we can see, there we have three different lengths in this system. This is the pal top, you know, contra angle based guidance system. And we have lengths of 20 millimeters, 25 millimeters, and 30 millimeters in length. The 30 millimeter length drills have a silver band, 25 millimeter lengths have a purple band, and the 20 millimeter lengths have a brown band. And here you can see there are drills, different diameters. That's clear, you can see. And you see they all have a purple band on them, right? Which means they are all of the 25 millimeter length. Now, we, we record or mark so it's easy to identify both the length and diameter of the drills. So for the length, here we can see we have a purple bands, right? That's why I put a purple circle, which means it's 25 millimeters in length. And here we have a brown band, right? That's why I put a brown circle um, or beige. And therefore we know it's 20 millimeter length. And here it's, you can see also again on this drill, although they all have a second color on this. If there were a silver band here, it would be the 30 millimeter length drill. Now drill diameters, we can look at the same way. Okay, that up band over here, right? That was we I just showed you was the drill drill um drill, excuse me the, the top band over here was the drill length purple, which means it's 25 millimeters long. And the second band is blue, and that signifies that the diameter of the of this drill or for the implant that it's for is 3.25 millimeters. Because 3.25 millimeters is the blue color in the PAL top system. And the green band is for 3.75 millimeters in diameter right? Purple, 25 millimeters in length. And the red, the red is going to be for 4.2 millimeters in diameter. And the beige or the brown over here would signify that it's a 20 millimeter length. So you can look at any drill, you look at the banding or the colors that are on it, and you'll automatically know what the appropriate drill diameter and length is. So this way also when your staff is going ahead and, and cleaning and reassembling the kit, um, after sterilization, it's very easy then for them to place the the pieces in the correct uh, in the correct places. The drill flute design is also excellent in terms of harvesting bone. You can see here we have uh, you know nice healthy looking bone that's inside the flutes. That also means that as you're cutting through the guide, if you're feeling that you're meeting some resistance, it means that the flutes are filled with bone and you need to pull the drill all the way out of the surgical guide. 
and clean the bone out. Usually I put it into a, a, a dish because I can use it to graft later on if it's necessarily required. So we can harvest lots of bone with this drill design. Now, how does it work? Well, here you see we're taking the drill, we're putting it into the into the sleeve, right? But you know, um, how is this drill finding the hole? Well, the drill design is such that the beginning of the drill is always smaller than the diameter of the hole. So the the previous drill always made a hole where the opening was bigger than where the next drill will start. So the drill will just drop into place. Right, and then you move the drill down until it engages the sleeve, until the DGS itself engages the sleeve, and then you bottom it out. Okay, this is by design, and it's calibrated according to the report. But you'll say, okay, but how do you make that first hole accurately if the drill is not being hugged or in close proximity to the sleeve? So here's how it works. You have the DGS, the Digital Guidance Sleeve. Okay. Now. The digital guidance sleeve goes into the surgical, into the into the sleeve in the surgical guide before the drill tip touches bone. So when you go ahead and you take the first drill, the first drill is always this starter drill. The starter drill goes into the DGS digital guidance sleeve, and you can see it's relatively short. You insert the digital guidance sleeve into the surgical guide, right? And it will always fit before that tip touches bone. You bottom that out, and you end up making a pilot osteotomy that's usually, oh, about two or three millimeters. So you have a starter hole before you come back with your next size drill. There's a report. The report will give the drilling length. See so here, it said it's 20 millimeters. Now, this is not tied to implant length. It's tied to a particular case. So you can go ahead and you can put an eight millimeter implant with a 20 millimeter length drill, or a 10 millimeter or a 13 millimeter length implant with a 20 millimeter drill. It's all based upon the planning that was done by you or your laboratory. And the report will print out exactly which size drill for any given site to use to, to the, the implant, as well as the uh, correct depth osteotomy will be created. Second important number that we have is the key offset. The offset is the number that's used when we go to deliver our implant. So you see here on the implant key, where the implant is being delivered, we can see numbers of 10, 12, 14, they're upside down because we're putting an implant into an axilla. It's not for a 10 millimeter implant or a 12 millimeter implant or a 14 millimeter implant. It's that relates to the key offset number. So for example, here, it's saying that the implant diameter is 4.2 millimeter and the implant length is 10 millimeter. So to correctly place that 10 millimeter implant, it just so happens that the key offset is also 10, but it could be 12 or it could be 16. It depends upon the positioning of the laboratory. We know to deliver the implant until it gets to the line that's in the middle of the number 10. So here's how it works. First, we use the short pilot drill. Again, the sleeve enters before the drill touches bone. We just now made an osteotomy that's probably about two or three millimeters deep. We then open the latch, we take out the drill, we put in the next diameter drill, it goes into, into place. This will be the 3.25 uh, millimeter drill. And now we go, it enters, it fits into the initial starter hole, and we now bottom out the DGS with inside the guide. When we finish going ahead and drilling our osteotomy, we will then go and swap out the drill and put in the next diameter drill until we get to the appropriate diameter for any given uh, for any given spot. So here we're just making sure that the guide is seated properly. Okay, we're inside the hole, because remember the opening of the hole is always wider than the start of the drill. We bottom that out. If you're we're going to be countersinking, okay, which you rarely do in Paltop, but here I'm showing you for demonstration, then we countersink, and then we do implant delivery again to the appropriately what we call key offset number which will be on the report till the implant is fully delivered. And that's how the system works. So let's look at, at a case. This one's a little, be a little different, but I put it in because it's somewhat interesting. Here's a, a young girl around 22 years old. She had had a, a, an accident uh, where she got uh, hit by a, a bus um, and she avulsed a central incisor tooth. And you can see she had a uh, root canal therapy in the adjacent tooth over here and it was originally restored with a zirconia bridge 
right, with, where we have a pontic that's cantilevered off the adjacent tooth, but now it's come point in time to, to go ahead and, and replace the missing tooth over here. Now, this case is, you know, a little complicated. It looks like there, well, it's a lot of space between the roots of the teeth, but, you know, we have some problems. We have, you see here, the, the incisive canal is fairly large, and I'll show you the path leading to that canal. And if we look at the space from the canal to the adjacent root, not much room. And I'll get rid of my red markings, and it'll be clear now where you can see the incisive canal that's, that's in that area over there. Well, why not just go ahead and, and make a bridge possibly for this? Well, this tooth here is potentially a problematic tooth. We may even have some internal resorption. Potentially that's starting in that area over there. So we're going to just leave that tooth alone. It may require additional treatment later on. So we take our CAT scan. We take our control surface scan. We merge the data sets. This is the way we do all our guided surgery cases. And we treat every patient you know, this way. So we do a complete analysis for every patient. Every patient gets a guide today. At the day of consultation, the patient gets a, a comb beam CT, and the patient gets a control surface scan, and we're ready, um, you know, immediately to go ahead and, you know, move on to the surgical phase after that, doing a very comprehensive analysis. So let's take a look, and we can see that, uh, you know, we may have some uh, challenges in this case. So if we look here, we'll see, well, I'll take a look at that. We have inadequate bone width, and we have a fair amount of that implant where there's a fair penetration of bone that's going to go ahead and, and need to be managed. And this was, is with a diameter that's 3.25 millimeters. And if you look at the position of the incisive canal, take a look at that. Okay, it's a relatively large incisive canal. There's the adjacent root of that tooth. Not much space. Remember, this is a 3.25 millimeter implant. So how much room do you think we have over here? Well, not much space. You know, here maybe we have a half a millimeter. Here we have less. Let's take a look uh, at our, uh, you know, uh, more frontal view over here. Wow, we have to navigate the root of the lateral incisor, right, and the incisive canal. And what's this? And some pathology that's going on over here that's going to need to be treated also. Well, perhaps we should go ahead and uh, orthodontically tip the root of this tooth, right, to move it out of the way, create more space for this patient. But take a look, if we look at the cranial x-ray, look at the, at the blunting of the root rel from the trauma that, that, that the uh, patient sustained a number of years before. And take a look at the foreshortening of that, uh, you know, of that root. So it's not an option to go ahead and orthodontically move that tooth. It's a problem tooth to begin with. It may be lost in the future. There might be some internal absorption that's starting. So we're not gonna start moving that tooth and depending upon that, that tooth. But we still have to manage this area for, that, for this patient. My idea is this. We're going to go ahead and we're going to do a bone graft, right? We're going to graft out the buckle so we can manage that area of, you know, fenestration. And we're going to increase the overall circumference of the arch in the graft at the same, at the same time. Now, once we do this, right, we're going to, we have created a fair amount of bone, you know, for this patient. And we can change the position of what our implant is going to be. Because now we can take the implant, now that we've increased the arch, and move it into a more ideal position. And in that position, we've got, you know, we can look at, at where our limiting factors were before, right? Here again was our incisive canal. Here is the root of our adjacent tooth. And we can see, well, you know, we have now a nice zone, right, or adequate bone that's going to support that implant. So that's the plan. The plan is going to be that we're going to harvest a monocortical block block from the external bleach bleak ridge as it ascends into the ramus and graft out that anterior area. So that was our plan. Beginning, we're looking, looking for long-term stability. This is a 22-year-old uh, 22-year-old girl. Well, about three days before the procedure, her father calls and says, you know, she's really kind of nervous. Um, I'm not sure this is for her. Um, are there other alternatives or things that uh, that we can go ahead and do for this patient? So we had to go back to the drawing board and said, okay, with the challenges that exist here, what alternatives might we have that might be reasonable to do for the patient? Even though I thought that, uh, you know, for long-term viability of that implant, um, it would be best to go ahead and more substantial graft that would solve a number of issues and problems, you know, for her. So again, these are the challenges we had to go ahead and deal with: um, fenestration of bone, incisive canal, you know, proximity of the adjacent roof, 
navigating the pathology that's going to be managed along with that with you know with that that root and the incisive canal not a, a simple case in an aesthetic in the aesthetic zone and so um this is what i thought of we thought of well maybe we can expand that bone using concepts of you know osseo osseo densification those of you that are familiar with that using the you know the concepts of of, of versa and and denser burrs uh, which I found to be very effective, you know, in my practice. There, it's another tool in my uh, in my toolbox uh, to look for that can provide solutions in many different areas. Nothing's a panacea, not for everything. But I said, you know what? Maybe it's reasonable to attempt to use osteodensification in this in this particular patient. So we took our plan for that and created a surgical guide because. We had a, a very narrow parameters that we had to go ahead and follow, as well as we had to remove the zirconia bridge, which, which meant destroying it and made a provisional restoration. So here's a milled provisional restoration. You see two of them because the shade is slightly different. And you can see that uh, there's a Maryland wing on it. So as opposed to just having a cantilever, I was going to utilize the adjacent tooth to rest on, uh, you know, for the, for the healing, healing period. If uh, you're going to do osteodensification with Paltop, so you go to the Versa site, and there are protocols for all the Paltop, uh, Paltop systems, as there, might, as there might be for other systems. So we have protocols for uh, osteodensification. So we go through the, the standard protocol. Now, why did I put this case here? Because with the Paltop fully guided kit, you can utilize Versa drills. Versa drills are 25 millimeters long. So they're comparable to the 25 millimeter length or the purple stripe drill that Paltop has. So if you're going to use osteodensification and Versa drills with the Paltop fully guided kit, okay, it works. It engages perfectly inside the system. Just ask the laboratory to set the measurement to 25 millimeters. Not 20 or not 30, but 25 because there's only one length of drill for the Versa drills. It will work very effectively. So we create the initial pilot osteotomy, even though I'm doing the case fully guided, because of the, the proximity of these vital structures, I'm going to take it step by step. So we go ahead and and uh, and place a guide pin from the the Paltop parallel pin kit. There's one that will make match to every drill, and this way I can go ahead and analyze it on the radiograph, okay, and see, okay, am I Am I following the path that I need to to both not engage the adjacent tooth as well as not viola, via, uh, violate the incisive canal? And once I verify that, I go to the next size versa drill. You know, we're running in reverse now to expand the bone. And then we move on from drill to drill until I get to the final drill diameter from the protocol right to correspond to the implant diameter that I have. Once I've gone there, I will go ahead and use a implant body try-in, also coming from the Alta parallel pin kit, which exactly corresponds to the diameter of the implant minus the threads. So in all my cases, all fully guided cases, I always use this particular pin. Most cases, I won't go ahead and check it with an intraoperative x-ray here only because of the proximity of these structures. I did that, but I will always put the implant body try-in. That's because I want to see to where it seats. So you can see here, I'm looking here at the 13 millimeter line. And this way I know when I seat the implant, okay, when I seat the implant and the torque starts, insertion torque starts becoming elevated, I know, did I reach my final position, right? Or, you know, do I need to go ahead and drive that implant, you know, further in terms of that? So I want to go ahead and use that implant body try and it just verifies where the final seating is supposed to be based upon the drilling depth that uh, that was designed you know by me or the lab and or the laboratory here we're going to put in a, a 3.25 by 13 millimeter length uh, advanced implant and it's delivered through the guide according to the drilling report so it's delivered to exactly the height and position that we want it to go ahead and be seated to and there you can go ahead and see it we've uh, successfully gone ahead and, and voided the incisive canal uh, radiographically, we'll see that we avoided the root of the tooth. You can see that we've expanded the bone. Remember how narrow it was? We've expanded the bone, so we, we've got adequate bone on both the buccal and palatal. 
We go ahead and I take ISQ measurements on all my cases so I can follow them, even though we're not immediately provisionalizing and I want to follow it at the time of restoration. And now, because I've expanded that bone, I like to graft over the buckle, even though there's no fenestration or no dehiscence. No dehiscence. And so this is actually an allograft mixed with locally harvested autogenous bone from those pal top drills. And I've covered it with a resorbable you know, collagen regenerative membrane and tack that into place to fixate the, the membrane. And we can go and see that here, you can see the, the cortical bone on the periphery of the incisive canal, and we haven't violated that. And we could see the lamina dura of the adjacent tooth there. You can see that we haven't violated that. So we had we had only had one exact place to put it, and we successfully placed the implant there. Not because we were lucky, not because I have many, many years placing implants, because we followed a, pro, a specific protocol, right, that uh, was objectively designed that I had to place the implant exactly where it needs to be for this particular given case. And I'm just going and jumping to the end of the case. The case was restored by an excellent uh, local restorative uh, doctor, Dr. Yula Derwab, um, and she re restored the case with uh, zirconia crowns. And you can see that we've gotten a, a nice result in that area. I left this pin in place. I didn't want to reopen and strip the soft tissue or the periosteum off the bone at, at that particular point in time. The pin looks stable, so we went ahead and, and left the, the pin there. We've got, I think, a reasonable result, result for a fairly complex case. Now, when you're going and you're and you're going to um, you're going to uh, do all these technological, digitally planned cases, right? And you want to gain the benefit of these types of systems. Make sure you use a system that has all the appropriate parts. So, what are the appropriate things? Well, you need you need to be able to surgical, you know, implant planning, which means that the planning software, whichever you're going to be using, needs to have the appropriate surgical libraries. And the surgical libraries today need to incorporate not just the external geometric form of the implant, but also the prosthetic connection that exists in that. In that. And the reason for that is because when we're going to do be doing immediate provisionalization, or using any of the features that we want relative to orient that orientation of the implant and the connection is important. It needs to be able to be planned into the case and into the fully guided system like we have with Palta. So we need to make sure that we have correct surgical libraries. We need to have full restorative design libraries also. Because again, we need to be able to integrate the surgery with a provisional and or final restoration. We need components that are designed for the digital age because we use different types of components. Most of the time we're using either multi-units or tie bases or different kinds of provisional components that go with that. And then we need systems that enable us to go ahead and place our, our implants you know, properly. So let's take a look at one case that kind of demonstrate the full range of products, a lot of things in the, in the technological age. So here's a patient that's going to be losing this bridge right over here. You can see the failing bridge, there's decay in both the cusp as well as the second premolar. Here's you see what, what the patient looks like clinically, right? And you see they actually had a successful implant that I did many years ago um, in this posterior tooth over, over here, in this first molar tooth. Now, the patient was not interested in wearing anything provisionally and was not interested in, uh, not wearing, we're interested in wearing anything removable provisionally, and also was not willing, even though it was pre, uh, you know, premolar teeth, although it was a cuspid, you know, said, listen, I need to have some kind of teeth to function with. And you can see they have a fairly heavy occlusion and not the best, not the best oral hygiene. Okay. So again, same two steps we always take at the consultation, intraoral surface scan, home beam CT scan. We do effective planning, right? Either, you know, we do it and, and or if you're not, don't have the software, you do this with your laboratory so we can ideally position the implants for the best uh, surgical and restorative outcome for you know, any particular given patient. Because we were going to be immediately provisionalizing it, then what we do is we take those implant positions, we import them into prosthetic design software, and because we have components and the libraries of these components, you know, from Paltop in the design software as well, as well as the provisional components that go with that, right, it's as if the implants had been placed and we took an impression and we took an impression, and uh, we knew ex we know exactly what abutment sizes to place based upon that. 
So here you can see we designed the, the temporary bridge that's going to be made. The reason there's an extra tooth over there. Remember, there's an implant that's un, underneath it that I placed previously. And I said, I want to be able to consider if I need to use that to help stabilize the restoration from the healed implant, I want to be able to engage that also. So here you see the provisional component placed in, and you can see there's actually space between the provisional component and the temporary, right? So that when this temporary bridge is made, it will fit and slide over these implant, over the over the temporary cylinders, and then we'll reline it with acrylic. Or well, if you like composite, you can go ahead and do that. But I don't want to fight with this provisional to make it fit and have to be adjusting it. I want it to slide exactly in place. So here are our two tools. We have our surgical guide. You'll notice it doesn't go around the whole arch. I just want to gain enough teeth to give me the stability that I need to go ahead and secure this. To, uh, to use my fully guided kit. If I, if the longer and bigger I make it where it's unnecessary, it only potentially complicates the seating of the surgical guide. So I don't make it, I, you know, I limit the extent of, of how big these guides are going to be. See, there are different colors and sizes of sleeves, and this relates to the, the colors relate to the length of the drill. This is telling me that on the report, it's gonna say to use a purple drill, which is 25 millimeters long. And these silver ones are for the 30 millimeter length drills. Because in the pal top system, the length of the fully guided drills, if it's brown the sleeve, or it'll be more of like a brass color, then it uh, it's a 20 millimeter length drill. If it's, if it's purple, it's a 25 millimeter length drill. If it's silver, it's a 30 millimeter drill. And the report will also tell me that. So I have lots of checks along the way to make sure I'm using the right length drills in terms of that. The different diameters uh, uh, figure and go along with have to do with uh, the ultimate diameter of the implants that are going to be placed. And here's the provisional of the restoration that's been milled from the manufacturing file from uh, those design specifications that were used in the design software. So we extract the tooth, debride the defects or the extraction sockets, seat the surgical guide, and then we go through our drilling sequence, right, until we get to whatever our final diameter is going to be. These were, uh, I believe, 3.75 millimeter implants, and they were dynamic, out top dynamic implants in a maxilla. So we're going to undersize the osteotomy, which means that we used a two millimeter drill and a 3.25 millimeter drill, and, and we didn't even go to the final 3.75 millimeter drill. We just allowed the implant to, you know, expand that, expand that bone, and therefore we got greater insertion torque and stability for our immediate provisional restoration. Here you can see our osteotomies. Okay, here you see our osteotomies. Here you see our guide pins in place. I told you oh, I always go in and check, uh, excuse me, to check the positions. Not so much for their orientation relative to the adjacent teeth, though I gain that benefit. Okay, but to see where the seating line is going to go ahead and be, and so that I know that I seat the implant properly. Now it's our implants. Again, these are the Paltap dynamic implants. Um, so they have a slightly more aggressive cutting thread, not super aggressive, but slightly more aggressive. And we seat the implants according to the report to the correct, uh, to the correct height, the correct position through the guide. Here we see our implants. And so you can see we have our two extraction sockets and the Patek site you can see is relatively, was relatively narrow, but all implants are placed exactly where they were required to be. And now I've taken some of the, of the locally harvested bone, which was in the cutting flutes, we harvest lots of bone in those flutes, and we're mixing it with a xenograft and grafting out those sites, both the intramony defects as well as grafting out the buckle of the of the tooth with the concavity, which had been the pontic site. Now we go and place our multi-units into position. This is how I like to restore these cases when I have multiple units, more than one. I don't like to use tie bases directly to the implants. I place the multi-unit. It gives me a lot, uh, 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 I think, uh, a lot of advantages. Um, you can have much more divergence between the implants. I'm breaking up the stress level. I'm putting the platform that we're restoring to, right, just subgingivally. And, uh, and, um, and long term, I think we're going to, it's an easier restoration, and I think we'll have better results. We take an intraoperative x-ray to make sure that the components are seated properly at this point before we go to the provisional stage. Now, once I verify that the multi-units are seated, we take this, the temporary cylinders, 
and I put the temporary cylinders on top of the implants and the conventional serration will just slide into place. This is where I don't want to waste time fighting with it, binding of the restoration, you know, or anything like that. In a case like this, sometimes I might have to slightly adjust the contact point, but I don't want to have to fight with it. So you can see that the within the software it's designed that I have some freedom, right? Because there could be slight variation of the ultimate implant position, especially in an extraction socket. I don't have to want to have to fight with restoration. I now take a relined apron. This is a Palton apron, and I place it over the cylinders so that when and I place the uh, cotton tip applicator sticks to occlude and block out the screw access hole. I put acrylic inside my my provisional serration and I seat it and I let it cure. And I go ahead and I pull the before the curing is complete. I pull out the wooden sticks. Once the curing is complete, right? I unscrew it and you can see the Aprons are kind of attached, you know, to the uh, to the temperate cylinders. They just peel right off. They're not really attached. They're just they're just the they're um, just adherent to it because from because of the flexibility of the material. And you see, I have some slight voids in this area, and so it's just simple. Simply, I just paint in into those voids. So very quickly, I can go ahead and I can finish this provisional restoration. It just takes several minutes to go ahead and do that. If you reline it with composite, you would do it even faster because you're not waiting for the acrylic to go ahead and set. Now, while this is happening, okay, I take the multi-unit healing abutments and I place it onto the multi-units. Uh, when you place the multi-unit healing abutments onto the multi-units, you should do this with a torque driver because you want to measure the torque, not because you want to put it in with a greater effort. No, you want to make sure you don't put it in too tightly because the multi-units were seated at, at 30 newton centimeter torque. If you take this and just by hand tighten the multi-unit healing abutments, you're probably, believe it or not, going to put them on with greater than 30 newton centimeter force. So that when you unscrew the multi-unit healing abutment, you're going to take out the multi-unit with it. My recommendation is, is set the torque driver to 5 newton centimeter, and then use that to place the multi-unit healing abutment on the multi-unit. Okay, so we, why are we placing this on? We place this on the, the multi-unit so that now we can go ahead and suture around it. So the sequence would be this. I would go and I would remove the provisional restoration that was relined. I would paint in that acrylic. While it's setting in the laboratory, I go and I screw on the multi-unit healing abutments. I take in the collagen plug. I cut these like little, like little pills of it, and I'll place that you know, over the graft. So this is just occlusive. It's just obstructive. It won't regenerate bone. I just don't want the graft material falling out. So for example, in an area like this, right, because remember the root of the tooth is much wider than this, uh, this implanted multi-unit healing abutment. I don't want to have to pull that soft tissue all the way up to here. I want to regenerate, right, to regenerate keratinized tissue in this area over here, as well as over here. So I go and I place that plug of collagen there to retain my graph material that I placed, and then I'm just putting in one, two, three, four simple interrupted sutures. By the time I finish suturing, the acrylic is set. I can clean up the excess acrylic from around my provisional restoration, and I'm ready to seat it into into place. And so now I just undo the healing about multi-unit healing abutments, and I seat the restoration into place. Check the occlusion, and the case is finished. So it can be done relatively quickly probably about an hour of treatment altogether to extract the teeth, prepare the osteotomies with the guide, seat the implants, graft the sites, reline the provisional, suture, and insert the provisional restoration. Now, here's a, a patient that had come to me after she had previously failed implant treatment. And you can see there's not much left of her maxilla. Okay, not much of her maxilla. She did not want to have her sinuses grafted. Right. And she had two remaining teeth that we were going to leave if they were going to help us, if they weren't going ahead and bothering anything. But you could see that we had many challenges in this case. I'm showing you for a very specific reason. I used a, one of the program digital techniques. This happens to be the one uh, called Chrome from Rowe Laboratory, uh, similar to that are techniques. Uh, from uh, and sequence and co-diagnostics. And there are a number of these program techniques. I like them. I like the concept of having a program technique. Here it's you go and you 
you secure with pins this printed bow to the maxilla, and this you, it acts as a level for you to reduce the bone, to have adequate bone reduction for an all on X type of technique. This is the surgical guide. It engages that bow. You go ahead and you prepare your osteotomies through it. Um, and then once you've done that, you seat this prosthetic platform where you see these rods and these rods engage the provisional restoration. So the, the, everything is pro programmed in. The exact uh, bone, amount of bone reduction that needs to be required, the position of the implants, the abutments that need to kind of be used, whether they're angled or there's straight multi-units, size and dimensions of them. And this is seated to the exact correct vertical dimension, as well as central position. There's minimal occlusal adjustment that needs to be done afterwards. So relatively quickly, usually it's about a three or three and a half hour case. And in a case like this, you go ahead and extract any remaining teeth, reduce the bone, place the implants, do any grafting that's required, uh, relatively simple grafting, and insert the multi-unit abutments, provisional restoration, and reline those segments that need to be relined. At the same time, not every patient that's going to have a full arch restoration is it necessarily appropriate to do an all on X type of technique. Here's a, a, a woman that was sent to my office actually for an all on X type of technique. Um, she said she didn't want her sinuses grafted, at least she walked in the door. But, you know, I felt uh, important to explain to her the differences between a, let's say, a more conventional crown and bitch style, style type restoration versus an all on X type of restoration, what the differences in procedure, in time, in result might be. And once she understood all of that, she said, well, you know, I think I would like something that's more traditional. And so I said, okay, that's what we're going to do. But I said, you know, I like a program digital technique. I like the technique that they have in these all on X programmed uh, techniques like Chrome. So is there a way that I can put a program technique to simplify the, what I'll call the more conventional sequential extraction strategy. And that's what I'm going to go and show you here. Uh, a, a technique that uh, some of you may be doing something similar, but uh, I'll say that I developed this one I'm going to show you today with my partner, Dr. Alon Waltuck. And so here's this young lady. She's going to lose all of her maxillary teeth. It doesn't look like she needs that from this x-ray, but you'll soon see later on that there's actually much less bone than, uh, than it appears that she has here. And so here was going to be the plan. We're going to extract all of those teeth. We were going to go then and, and, and place implants to restore her entire maxilla, which included grafting her sinuses. So here was the plan. We were going to go ahead and place these four implants. Here you can see on the cone beam their designated positions and graft both her sinuses. And this is all going to be done at the same time so that we can then add four more implants, two on either side to give her a total of 12 teeth, first small to first molar, completely supported. Now, what we're we going to do in the interim, right, because she didn't want to wear a denture, and, and I don't like to place patients into dentures if I can avoid it specifically. I don't like dentures sitting on top of healing implants. So we're going to use a sequential extraction strategy, and we're going to keep these teeth. We're going to keep a cuspid and the contralateral lateral and cuspid. These teeth were somewhat stable, and so they can be kept certainly to retain a provisional restoration. But now we have to start to think and say, okay, you know, how do I go ahead and how do I create efficiency in this case? Is there, are there, is there a way that I can do it differently than I would normally go ahead and do it where I would probably prepare those teeth and take a provisional and provisionalize, you know, all the teeth and then bring the patient back and extract teeth. And then, you know, is there a way that I can go ahead and create efficiency like in the all on X type of technique? So here was, was our attempt. Remember I said we were putting in four implants and we we're going to keep these three teeth for the provisional restoration. So there you see it, cuspid, lateral, contralateral cuspid. Here you can see the, the, uh, the transitional partial, that it, not transitional, but the partial denture that she had had actually for many years. And so the idea is those three teeth were going to be prepared. So here it is, first appointment for treatment. Okay, the patient comes in one hour, we prepare cuspid, lateral, contralateral, and place provisional restorations on them. 
okay one hour treatment and we take an intraoral surface scan we take a digital scan okay so now we have our scan and our comb bc comb beam ct scan right so we have one two three teeth right here you see that scan now we go and the patient goes home okay the patient goes home we take those two data sets we merge them together right and we do our surgical planning for our four implants so here you see our four implant positions as we planned before right it's going to be the second premolar the lateral right ventral incisor and a second premolar tooth and we can see the three prepared teeth now with this design software now we can virtually extract right we virtually extract those teeth keeping only the teeth that we were planning there well why are our implants here because remember we can take our implant plan and we can merge it with uh, with our design software as if the implants had already been placed so it's as if an impression had been already taken you know in those in those areas so we've gone ahead and merged the two data sets right so it's as if the patient came in and we extracted the teeth now we go ahead and design the provisional restoration she liked the way her teeth looked and so therefore we just replicated what she had inside her mouth so there we see her provisional restoration and it's a duplication of the way her teeth looked before okay simple as that and you can see here that we've got uh, the two teeth can't leave it off on either side and here we've got the ponte the abutment site abutment site abutment site that corresponds to the abutments that uh, are in the impression now we have those two cantilevers and those two cantilevers are of concern to me right i'm trying to do things uh, you know simply and gain the efficiencies of digital technology free digital technology i would have managed just by having had a provisional made that had a cast metal reinforced uh, whole substructure that was embedded inside this but that requires a whole different laboratory technique very intensive i'm trying to go ahead and say can i do this efficiently can i do it quickly can i do it at low cost in terms of doing this but i don't want the patient coming in once a week with with the with the uh cantilevers fractured off so i said well what if we do this in zirconia we do this in zirconia and if i use monolithic zirconia and we have a design like this it doesn't have to cost me a lot of money to get it fabricated so I go and I have this fabricated in zirconia, but if it doesn't fit, wow, that's going to be difficult. So I said, let me get a backup in PMMA, because again, in the digital age, it's the same exact design file. So we have the same design file, and I have laboratory make one in PMMA and one in zirconia. They look exactly alike, but if the problem in the zirconia doesn't fit, well, I can adjust that PMA relatively quickly, which I can't do with that with that zirconia. So that's my bailout that I have there. So the patient comes in. The patient comes in. There she is. I first open up the sinuses, right? I'm leaving the anterior alone. This way I can more effectively manage the local anesthesia, right? So here I'm using a PA as a tome, right? Opening up the sinus. And we're rel relatively quickly going ahead and grafting, you know, one sinus, and we graft the second sinus. Now I go ahead and I remove the provisional restorations right of the teeth that are going to be kept right one two uh, this one is giving me a little bit of a harder time take off the temporary right okay and there we go okay we clean off the teeth and we now go and extract the teeth and you can see right you can see why these teeth weren't being kept for any type of uh, final restoration they have not much root fairly mobile teeth right and resort roots so there we go there we have right we have our teeth extracted we have bilateral sinus grafts done and here are our prepared teeth and wow lo and behold it looks exactly like what we had planned right here we have our prepared teeth right right with our virtual extraction so we know that we can replicate it with today's technology we can really uh, uh, pre-create what's going to happen right and that allows us many advantages and opportunities for us to do things so there's our provisional restoration right and it's going to fit and slide right on top of these teeth or at least that's what i hope but i've got my backup right i got my zirconia right and at the same time i have my mma in case i need it as a bailout 
Okay, so now I'm holding my breath, right? I'm holding my breath. I'm going to try it, and I haven't placed any implants yet. Here's my zirconia restoration, just like the design file. I'm holding my breath, and I put it into place. Wow, right into place. You know, so how much was my restorative time in this case? Well, what, one or two minutes? It's going to be the amount of time it takes me to cement this restoration here. Wow, that's creating some efficiency. Now, there's one thing that I didn't tell you, and that's that we put extra die spacer layers, right? We put in, in the planning software, the design software, extra die spacer to give us a little bit of leeway and latitude, right? So that this restoration will, will fit. But it fits very well. Now we're ready to place our implants. So here you can see our surgical guide, right? You can see the sleeves are purple. Why are they purple? because it's telling me to use 25 millimeter length drills. And there's our plan. So now I take my surgical guide. Remember, it's designed to fit on my prepared teeth. It fits right into place. We check our windows to make sure that, that uh, it's completely seated. So you can see that uh, it's a moving target. We can see that in that tooth right there. Okay, so now we know it's seated well. There I'm checking the windows. And I'm ready to go and to start preparing my osteotomies. So I put it in my drill. Here's my two millimeter drill. I go right into right into that first uh, osteotomy, and I do one. I do two. I do three. So you see, we can go ahead and do this relatively relatively quickly. Now I go and I go to the next size drill. Here, it's the next size drill is going to be the 3.25 millimeter drill, and I'm finished with the osteotomies. Because again, I'm going to put in Paltap dynamic implants into this case. I put my guide, my my implant body try-ins, like I said, I always do. Okay, and I check my final positions because I can always make a change at this point, and I know want to know exactly where they're going to be seated. I'm happy with my positions as I should be. All right, and now I'm ready to go and deliver my implants. So again, these are Paltap dynamic implants. Here you see 3.75 by 13 millimeters, they're going to a max maxillary extraction sockets. So I undersize them, right, by one size, which means I only use the two millimeter drill and the 3.25 millimeter drill, and I deliver them all to place. So there we go, the surgery is now finished, bilateral sinus grafts, extract, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, or maybe with six teeth, right, and place four implants, and then we go to seed our restoration. All right, so remember, I have no restorative time up to this point. I just tried it in, and now it goes right into place. And we have our, our uh, restoration in place. And we can see, looking at this, we can see that it mimics exactly what our plan should be, which is what we should expect. We have many years experience already with fully guided surgery. We're just providing a system that goes ahead and allows it to do it quickly and efficiently, right? And manage some of the previous issues, whether it's irrigation or, or metal filings or intra uh, arch space. And so you can very fluidly go ahead and go ahead and create your plan. And you see everything exactly rep you know, uh, uh, replicates what was required from the, from the planning in a case, even that's somewhat it's complex. So my goal in this case was to what, what? To go ahead and follow the all-in-4 type of program techniques. So it was one appointment for data collection, right? That's when the patient go ahead, when came for, for, the, for the consultation. Okay, what was the data collection? Intraoral scan, comb beam CT scan. Next appointment, I prepared, um, I prepared three teeth, one hour, right? Next appointment, what was their sort of time? Just the amount of time it took to cement the restoration. Okay, so I believe that we were able to accomplish that, okay, um, you know, in terms of creating efficiencies for this type of, for this type of technique, this sequential extraction case. And the case actually is finished, and I, I really need to add those slides to, uh, to my lecture here, so uh, in the future I'll show that to you. Now, this young lady came in who had had implant treatment oh, many, many years ago, not in our office, and I don't say, say that I would necessarily put the implants in these positions, but they're probably in the patient's mouth 20 more years. But she came in now with the bridge broken. Okay, the bridge broken. She has implants broken. She has abutments fractured. And she requires help because this is just flopping in and out of her mouth. Now, I wasn't, you know, in uh, my office on that day. And my partner, Dr. Waltuk, was there. But he had a full schedule, right? And this is what presented to him. 
And so how can he go ahead and manage this patient, right, who requires treatment that day? She, she can't eat. This bridge is, you know, flopping in and out on fractured implants. So he went ahead and he, he squeezed out about uh, a half hour of time. She comes in at nine o'clock in the morning, right? Half hour of time, he takes the parts and pieces off, right? He puts it on some of these cups I use, he puts it on some scan abutments, and takes a scan. So he says, okay, I can use these one, two, three abutments. Here you can see one of the fractured, uh, fractured heads of the, of the implants that were there. And so he said, okay, I can use those. And he takes his digital impressions. Now it's 9.30. This is the data that he's collected, right? He's taken his scan, right? He's, and he, these are the abutments that he can go ahead and, and utilize for what he's doing. And I'll introduce the concept. Some of you may already do this, and it's called virtual technician. And what he does is, is he takes the data, which he scanned, and he sends it to the laboratory. How does he send it? Does it put it in the laboratory bag? No, he presses a button. So the patient came at 9.30, 9 o'clock with a problem. He really didn't have time, but he supposed that a half hour is an emergency. He takes the bridge out, the scan abutments, takes the scan, presses a button, it goes off to the laboratory. The laboratory now does the provisional restoration design on top of this. How long does it take to do them? Well, it may something like two hours. It's not so, so, so fast to go ahead and do that. So they receive the data at 9.30. By 11.30, they've gone ahead and they have created a manufacturing file, right? These design files for this provisional restoration. What do they do? They send it back to the dental office. How do they do that? They press a button. So now it's 11.30. At 11.30, it's back inside the office, inside the office. We have a milling machine. This happens to be an Amon Gibras Herbal Motion 2. The, our assistant goes and takes it, picks the appropriate uh, shade of puck, puts it inside, presses the button, and it goes ahead and manufactures the provisional restoration. How does that take? Well, something this size takes about two and a half hours, right? So remember, we got at 11.30, so now it's two o'clock in the afternoon. So two o'clock in the afternoon, we have a provisional restoration that's ready to put inside the patient's mouth. Well, we don't have time, right? Dr. Wolf, it's been busy all day, but we bring the patient back in at the end of the day, and we can insert the provisional restoration. By the way, my assistant didn't have to press the buttons. Theoretically, the laboratory can even control this machine remotely. So we scan in the dental office. The design work is done in the laboratory. The laboratory sends those manufacturing files back to the office. We manufacture in the office, and then we insert into the office. So this is a, a workflow that I am suggesting, not for every case, not for every patient, maybe it's small restorations, maybe it's provisional restorations, maybe it's emergency type of restorations to manage things. And you know what, in the age of uh, COVID-19 coronavirus, we wanna get more done in the office without having to bring patients in and out, maybe we need to be thinking more along these types of lines. The patient comes in the morning with an emergency and we were able to give the patient what I would call full arch resolution the same day. Not the most beautiful provisional restoration, but certainly something the patient can go out and function and talk and eat and do all the things that she needs to do you know, throughout the day. Where previously without technology, this would have been impossible for us to go ahead and, and manage and do at least in that segment of time for this patient. Now, I'd like to introduce to you a, a very nice young lady. This is Carol, she's 96 years old. She comes in and she says to me, listen, I don't care if I have, you know, implants for two days. I want to get rid of, at this point in my life, my removable teeth, and I want to have permanent teeth. So great. You know, she wants, she, she's healthy. She's 96. But I don't care how healthy she is and 96 years old, how long can this person sit inside that dental chair? So we have to be able to do minimally invasive treatment. So, okay, all of us know very well how to go to do this. So we can go ahead and we create a, a simple plan that we can see the surgical guide, do minimal flap reflection. I like to flap the, 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 uh, the soft tissue in almost every case because I want to preserve and manage the keratinized tissue. But I just need to expose the crest of the, of the ridge. We can very rapidly go and place the, the implants. So to do this, again, at 96 years old, she doesn't want, you know, four appointments to get her prepared for this. It's one appointment is the data collection. That's the day she comes in for her consultation. And that's a, you know, using a, a dual scan technique, you know, for edentulous arches 
So one first appointment is data collection and consultation. And the second appointment, she has a minimally invasive surgery that can be done relatively, you know, rapidly. You know, in under an hour, 45 minutes to an hour, we can go ahead and do this procedure for her. She's walking out the door. She wants to know when we're doing her maxilla. Okay. And so I said, well, let's see how you do over the next two to three weeks. But three weeks later, sure enough, she came in and we placed her maxillary implants. We, you know, I searched to find where I could, you know, place the implants in the bone that, that she had. And that was accomplished. So again, appointment number one, we collected the data, which was a dual scan, the day of her consultation. That was for both the mandible and maxilla, same appointment. Second appointment, she had her mandibular surgery. And third appointment, she had her maxillary surgery. Without digital technology, I don't think it would be possible to treat a patient like this. Not at 96 years old. It, I'm not sure how she, they, they can tolerate you know, anything more invasive than, than that. There are many other applications and things that we go ahead and do. We do guided implant uncovering. Here's a patient where uh, uh, we I got both teeth placed implants or acquired some grafting, but we wanted to go ahead and move the treatment along. So without having to go ahead and raise a flap and find the implants, right? I was able to seat the guide. There's a wide zone of keratinized tissue here. Put my soft tissue trephine directly through the guide to find the implants. And you can see here, you can't even see them because they're covered in bone. Bone grew all over the top. But I'm able to go ahead and I know exactly where the implants are because I, I use the same guide to uncover them that I place the implants so I can remove the bone over the implants, place my multi-units, and take impressions all in the same day, not having to worry that I'm going to have any significant soft tissue changes. Again, the age of coronavirus, this is what we're looking to go ahead and do. We're looking at least in my office to go ahead and say, can we go ahead and evaluate and assess each patient, get the maximum amount of treatment done at any given appointment. Now we always did that. We, you know, we wouldn't bring patients back and forth, you know, many, many times, but there are ways that we can do even more for the patient. So here on the day that I uncover the implants, I can be taking final impressions so that the next appointment we can deliver the final restoration. Because again, today I want to minimize the number of point times that I have to have encounters with that patient, bring them in and out of the office. Because that's going that's the biggest challenge bringing you know patient after patient and changing over the operatories, you know, uh, in in today's day and age until we we figure out really how to manage, you know, the time of uh, time of coronavirus. So the more I can do it one time, right, the better off both uh, I'm going to be, my patient's going to be, patients are happier. I think it's a great marketing idea to be able to say that to that in patients. You know, with technology now also, we use PMMA for our provisional Maryland bridges. We used to do a little cast metal reinforcement. But we can come up with all kinds of innovative designs, right, that, uh, that we can go ahead and utilize. Sometimes we'll even make more than one so that if we place the provisional in, and we bond it, and now we have to destroy it to remove it to do some ty other type of procedure, I can just bond the next one in because, again, I'm using a digital file. I can make multiple of the same really at no additional cost. Um, and we can come up with all kinds of you know innovative designs. In a case like this, this was a, a young lady for a different lecture. We'll talk about how to manage this patient who lost three consecutive teeth, two central incisors and a lateral incisor, right? And we sequentially did the case I first placed um, um, one implant, provisionalized it, moved on to the second implant after this, the soft tissue had a chance to heal and mature because I wanted to try and maintain the papilla, right? And so here you can see I'm delivering this with the with a surgical guide. It's always planned. And here you see I have a pontic site where this implant, the newest implant was being placed, and I'm going in and engaging the implant, the connection, on the implant that's already healed, and I've got a pontic site to go ahead and develop the soft tissue, right, for the for the pontic that's going to be in the lateral incisor site, as well as Maryland Bridge to stabilize this. So we can do virtually not anything, but we can very be very innovative and creative. And this is again, we're managing three things at the same time. We're going to manage where we're provisionalizing a site that we extracted a tooth. We're managing provisionalizing an implant that had already been placed and healed. We're, we're, we're with this managing the soft tissue, both in the pontic site and the papilla, so that we get an aesthetic result. And the whole case is a very fascinating, interesting case. It's actually been completed, and again, for a different for a different day. Custom healing abutments, right? We can use it to manage uh, soft tissue profiles. You know, as you see here, we have a, a patient that's got in a sunken ridge, right? And a tooth was extracted, and it's a loss of uh, or absorption of some buccal plate. 
and I want to go ahead and when I make my restoration, I want to have teeth that appear to come out of the soft tissue and not have that, you know, cervical uh, cervical uh, indentation, which is a big giveaway for the teeth, but also uncomfortable because it becomes a food impact. Right? So how does the laboratory manage this? I have them wax up the tooth to the full contour and shape that it needs to be, regardless of where the soft tissue is, so that it's in line with the cervicals of the adjacent teeth. And then from that, it's like designing a custom abutment. They design what would be a custom abutment without the the coronal section of it, right? And so here it is designed. There you can see here's the the manufacturing file that's been created from this. Here's the machine titanium blank, and then it's play at the time of surgery. All I do is bisect this soft tissue, so I leave an adequate zone of keratinized tissue, and and I surgically corrected this concavity not with a connected tissue graft, not with any type of bone simply by putting a component or a part, which is a custom abutment designed to the ideal uh, ideal buccal contour that I'd like to develop for that patient. So here you can go ahead and see this nice buccal contour that we have, right? And so we've corrected this deformity, not with any grafting, simply by inserting a component. And there are, are many different applications you know, of that. In the benefits of technology, right, we need to always think differently and think the way we used to, we need to understand the technology, what it can do, and then we can solve problems you know, and create efficiencies for our patients for better, for better outcomes. And that, again, that requires not only thinking differently, but also working differently. So I'd like to end with just one patient. And this was a very nice young girl that I had the privilege of treating. She's 18 years old, born congenitally missing 26 teeth. And so I'm gonna show you, this is, uh, through video form, I'll show you the initial diagnostics of how we manage this patient. So here she is, here's how she appeared at 18 years old. If you'll take a look and you'll see, all of these teeth are primary teeth. Now if you have one primary tooth, sometimes you can place a restoration on it and manage that tooth until it becomes problematic. But not when you have this many primary teeth. So you can see there are no roots on any of these teeth. There are no subsequent teeth coming after that. The only teeth permanent teeth that she has are these teeth here, which are what? Which are two maxillary second premolars, two central incisors, and two mandibular second molars. So in the mandible, only second molars. In the maxilla, maxilla she has centrals and, and molars also. She was treated by the chairman of the Department of Orthodontics at the University of Pennsylvania, who did a very nice job aligning the midline of the two central incisors, which was critical and key, and I think a very important aesthetic parameter you know, that he was able to manage, and the fact that she had those two teeth was really a blessing for her. He then went and expanded the maxilla you know, to a point where he thought was appropriate arch form for her. And again, he did a pretty good job for that. And so here's how the her treatment went in a complete digi uh, digital protocol from both the diagnostic, provisional, surgical management, as well as final restorative uh, uh, management. <laughs>
second molar teeth in the mandible. And that's because I didn't want to go ahead and do any vertical augmentation posteriorly there. I thought it was going to be more too complex and not so predictable for her. And so zirconia copings were placed on the posterior teeth on those molars. And then there was a four unit bridge made, which went over cemented, temporarily cemented over the zirconia copings. The zirconia copings were permanently cemented onto the molar teeth, just as we used to do with gold copings. And then anteriorly, there was a, uh, um, it sat screw retained on two multi units. So those are the four, the four unit segments in that, in that case. So I'd like you to thank you for spending some time with me. Um, I hope I have uh, presented some information to you that uh, will get you thinking. Um, you know, uh, you know, technology really is here to stay and it can really help and aid our patients. We need to understand it and we can understand it. We can create very effective tools for giving our patients opportunities for treatment. Uh, in what the treatment is and how we treat them in ways that we never thought about before. So I'm happy to entertain any questions that you may now have. Um, if you have something that uh, you don't think of or you want to ask me later on, you can reach me at m.klein at altopdental.com. Okay, and now we're ready for any questions. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now we're ready for our questions. Um, and let's see, question number one. When do you think freehand is more predictable? So I'm uh, assuming that the question is referencing uh, when do we think uh, doing conventional freehanded surgery to create our osteotomies is more predictable than uh, using a surgical guide. Okay, so, you know, number one, uh, I'll answer that question uh, in, in several different ways. So, you know, number one, using a surgical guide, any type of surgical guide, even the conventional ones we had before, not computer generated surgical guides, are, uh, you know, always going to be more predictable in terms of going ahead and placing an implant. Now, if we reference specifically computer generated guides, well, you know, assuming that the data is accurate, Okay, when the data is good, what do I mean by that? Assuming that um, the cone beam or the CT is of good quality, there's not a lot of patient movement. Assuming the, the intraoral scan is good or the laboratory scan of the models is taken of a good model and the mesh is good and all those things are good, then you're always going to be more accurate going ahead and generating or use, utilizing a, a, surgical, uh, a surgical guide. Now, that doesn't mean that you can just close your eyes and blindly use the surgical guide. No, it's a tool like anything else. As I showed in, in one of the cases I showed you there, you know, when I'm in a, a situation where um, there's consideration that there's zero room for error, I, even though I'm, I'm using a surgical guide created from good data, right, and careful analysis, right, um, I still can check myself all along the way. Uh, because there are many different factors that can go ahead and, and affect that. So you need to understand the guide. You need to understand the system that you're using to go ahead and place uh, or, or to go ahead and utilize the guide, the surgical system, what the limitations might be, what are the contours and shapes of bone, and how that may affect the reliability of the guide. Are you drilling at an angle? Is it an extraction socket? Okay, you know, what's the proximity to very vital structures? And you need to check yourself along the way. So again, it's a tool you need to use along with uh, your common sense and more ex experience and expertise. Next question, do you think pilot guides are accurate enough? Okay, so there you go again, it depends on what you're going ahead and utilizing the guide for, but many people, many people, okay, say, well, you know, I'm fairly good and competent at going ahead and drilling osteotomies. Um, and so if I'm just shown the overall, you know, location, angle, depth, you know, the, the mesial distal position, the buccal lingual position, right, the angulation that I want to place the implant that I create with a, with a, uh, a pilot guide, I can now finish the osteotomy by, my, by myself. Uh, I don't think there's any problem with that. And I think you can be, you know, fairly predictable going ahead and utilizing that. And again, 
depending upon, you know, uh, proximity of anatomic structures, structures, uh, and how, uh, how critical that positioning it is, you know, you may want to go ahead and use a fully guided surgical guide or a pilot guide. Now, even if you use a fully guided surgical guide, it doesn't mean they have to permit yourself to every stage, meaning you can create the osteotomies and you may elect to place the implant without the guide. Again, it's a tool, understand the tool and how it works, and then you'll understand how to best utilize it, you know, in your own hands. Next question, what are your indications for soft tissue graft? Okay, well, you know, that's a, a big question because we use soft tissue grafting for many, many, uh, you know, indications. Everything from, you know, gaining root coverage, you know, or it could be gaining implant coverage to, uh, to modifying uh, soft tissue defects to building, you know, robust health, you know, health, healthy uh, keratinized tissue around the implant. So again, you know, that's kind of a, a difficult question to ask in terms of, you know, uh, what are your indications, you know, for soft tissue graft? I'm gonna pop up another question as a follow-up for that. I can probably better, you know, answer, you know, answer that in terms of going ahead and using that. But in, in implant dentistry, my routine use really is uh, in aesthetic ca cases, when I'm in the uh, anterior maxilla, anterior mandible for an aesthetic case. Um, I'm going to go ahead and almost always, I never use the word always, uh, but almost always augment the tissue with a subepithelial connective tissue graft that I place through a tunneling you know, procedure. Next question. How do you decide to do digital or not when you do immediate loading? Okay, so, uh, you know, again, immediate loading for me is not, that's not the critical factor. The critical factor is, is how do I obtain the best result, you know, for any given patient at any given time? And for, for sure, the more upfront data I have for analysis, meaning cone beam CT, meaning intraoral surface scanning that I integrate with it, so that I can really have almost the patient in my hand and I can do the surgical procedure in my, you know, uh, because I'm looking at the implant placement, whether I've done it or the laboratory has done it, and I can then understand and encounter all the things that may occur during the surgery, right? And then create a tool that allows me to implement that, okay? That's gonna always create for me the greatest predictability. Just because I have that tool, just because I made that guide, you know, I don't feel committed to have to use it or to have to use it for every step of the way. So I'm going to use what, what suits me best in terms of going ahead and doing that. For immediate provisionalization, I think that uh, that's a, a key or critical indication for going digital. Because with that, we create all the other tools. So we create a guide that allows us to position the implant precisely, you know, within whether it's the extraction shot socket or the alveolar, you know, residual healed alveolar ridge in the correct position and the great vertical height, okay, for uh, that will allow either for the prosthetic components that are necessary, have, you know, adequate space to put that as well as their sort of material and or in an aesthetic case, go ahead and have the implant placed in the appropriate vertical position to develop a, a, an aesthetic emergence profile you know, for, that, for, the, for that particular patient. Now, in addition to that, I can now develop or have fabricated for me a provisional restoration that will exactly fit place. And I, and I didn't show any of those cases you know, uh, today, but today I always, also always have a positioning guide. So I have a guide, it almost looks like a surgical guide or a night guard, and it engages the teeth like the surgical guide does, but it also engages the provisional restoration. So it seats the provisional re restoration to the exact position, right? The, the exact rotational position, buccal lingual position, uh, vertical height position. So I have a very simple way of exactly positioning my implant so that I have minimal adjustment, you know, afterwards. Okay, next question. If I don't have to manufacture, oh, let me get my glasses. Uh, if I don't have to manufacture the cows, can I get the digital guide and the crowd from Paltop? Okay, so, you know, depending upon, you know, what country you're calling from um, or asking from, but uh, in Israel, Paltop goes ahead and uh, has a digital laboratory that will fabricate um, the, the guide and, and provisional restorations for the patient. However, in the rest of the world, uh, depending upon who your distributor is, they may go ahead and have a digital service. In the United States, 
uh, through Keystone. We don't have a digital service, but what Paltop has done is enabled all the major softwares, you know, with its libraries for its systems. So, for example, uh, for the surgical guides in Implant Studio, Three Shape Implant Studio, in uh, Blue Sky software. Uh, Coming out now that the libraries are in uh, Exoplan software from Exocad, soon to be in Simplant, Anatomage. So all the major companies go ahead and have the, the planning you know, software or libraries in it so that you can utilize Paltop's fully guided system with their components. So you can plan for that. You just select the Paltop library um, and, uh, and place the Paltop implants. Those are the geometric implant forms that will appear. It has all the lines of Paltop implants, as well as the sleeve libraries for, you know, for Paltop and how they engage with the surgical system. So, you know, you just ask your laboratory that does the planning. Um, and there are many, many laboratories that are very good at that in the United States, um, utilize you know, the Paltop libraries for the Paltop fully guided system, and they'll produce a guide for you that can engage with Paltop's fully guided kit. Okay, uh, next question. The Bodo particles you have shown here were collected by the drills or are substitute? So uh, I'm not sure which case. I'm assuming it's the case where you saw that I, I uh, mixed two different types of materials, locally harvested the autogenous bone and the xenograph material. Uh, but I believe all the materials that I've shown in this lecture were, were in the autogenous bone. It was just bone that was harvested from the flutes of the drill. So not with a bone scraping or trephines or anything like that, but we collect lots and lots of bone with the fluting design of the pal top drill. And the, in the fully guided kit, uh, that flute design is the same as in their conventional kit for, let's call it placing implants by hand. And it collects a lot of bone, more than you would, uh, more than you would expect. Um, the other types of uh, bone that I have shown there uh, might be mineralized allograft uh, and or also uh, xenograft, cow bone that uh, if I want something that's relatively either non-resorbable or relatively slowly resorbing. Okay, um, I think we are uh, finished with our questions. Um, I thank you for uh, attending. I have hoped I've provided some uh, uh, interesting ideas and concepts um, and get you excited about thinking about uh, you know, digital protocols and how you might want to uh, either uh, bring digital technology and protocols into your office and see how it can help, um, as well as if you're already doing that, maybe you know I've uh, put an idea or two that the way I do some things differently. I believe, especially today in the age of uh, coronavirus, COVID-19, that we're gonna be thinking about doing more and more of this because technology enables us to go ahead um, not only communicate, you know, not directly, you know, over the internet, technology will enable us to go ahead and increase the number of patient interactions that we have to have. And I think that's going to become, you know, significant. We want to get the patients in. We want to do as much treatment as we possibly can, right? And have and decrease the number of, uh, of visits that are inside. And certainly if we can go ahead and, and provide treatment, minimizing the amount of uh, things that we have to do in the office, cutting, drilling, all those things, and do in a very contained manner, that'll certainly also be beneficial. So thank you again for attending this webinar today. It will be on demand on the Paltop Academy website if you want to review something or if you want to recommend it to a friend. Otherwise, stay safe and healthy.